Every engraving is unique in various ways, using different methods and tools. Now I'd like to show you the tools that I used while creating the plate for Labyrinth Valley. At the top is a pencil that marks on shiny surfaces, such as a copper plate. Next is a roulette that impresses a row of little dots. A scraper with a steel burnisher on the opposite end. A scraper wrapped with plastic tape. A 10 power magnifier. A burnisher made from a polished agate stone. A steel burnisher with an etching needle on the opposite end. And a burin. Now the burin is the most important tool that I use. And it has to be kept perfectly sharp. If it loses its point, it will skip across the plate and put a scratch in the image. I sharpen the burin by grinding it against a sharpening stone. I hone the face at a 45 degree angle, then hone the flat edges of the shaft. This is the copper plate. I've already cut it to the correct size. The copper surface shows a lot of tarnish and I'll need to clean it up later with copper cleaner. The edges of the plate must be filed so that they have a bevel. However, beveling the edges leaves the corners very sharp and dangerous, so I'll round them off with the file also. This was a complex composition so it was helpful to have some preliminary marks on the plate. First, I coated the plate with beeswax. It's just barely visible in this photograph. Then the plate went to the press. The drawing was placed in register on the plate and held in place with scotch tape. Then it was run through the press. Under pressure, the graphite image stuck to the plate. I traced through the graphite lines with an etching needle to make the guidelines. Sometimes I use the roulette, shown again in the center of this photograph, to make lines composed of little dots. At other times I may use this diamond point, shown at the bottom. It fits into a holder for drafting leads. But whether using the roulette or the etching needle, my goal is just to fix a few reference lines before starting to cut lines with the burin, and that's when the fun begins. So here's where I work. It's one end of a crude old table. I've added a couple of things to it to make it a little easier to use. The white foam board juts out at a 45 degree angle, and it reflects light rays straight down into the plate. Early engravers used a sheet of white cloth to do the same thing. I've pinned my reference sketch to the reflecting board where it's easy to see. The workbench has a small rack that I can pull out or push in like a drawer. It's not really necessary, but it's handy. Here the rack holds a round engraver's pad. This pad is often helpful for cutting curved lines or for supporting one end or a corner of a very large plate. But I often use a rolled up piece of printing felt to support the plate. A small plate is sometimes difficult to handle, so I've attached this plate to a mounting base made from a piece of masonite. With this setup, I can engrave very fine straight lines. I wanted the plate to remain in a constant alignment, so I've placed a couple of heavy steel weights on the edge of the mounting base. Notice the wooden peg that also helps anchor the plate to one spot on the bench. 
So that's my workbench. I also used the magnifying lens that you see here. And here is a view of magnified lines as seen through that lens. A Buren only wants to cut straight ahead. It never wants to go left or right. So I always cut curved lines by turning the plate. With the round engraver's pad on the rack, the plate can be turned easily. The only source of light in the studio is directed toward the reflecting board and from there downward toward the plate. I often glance at reference drawings pinned to the board over my shoulder. And this is a view through the magnifier. As the point of the burin skims through the copper surface, the copper is diverted into little strips that curl up like watch springs. In this view through the magnifier, some reference lines have been drawn on the plate with a marking pencil to help guide the line directions. Here's another view through the lens. It also shows reference lines that were made with the marking pencil. Other lines were made with the etching needle and the roulette. The crisp lines have been cut with the burin. The burin often leaves copper burrs standing up on the surface of the plate. The earliest engravers five or six centuries ago didn't remove the burrs, but I usually scrape them away. The scraper has three cutting edges and I sharpen them every time I use the scraper. The scraper is also used to lighten or remove unwanted lines. On Labyrinth Valley, there was an imperfection, a pit in the plate. So I used the scraper to reduce the depth of the pit, shaving off small particles of copper. I didn't shave it deep enough to remove the pit entirely, so it will print as a slightly noticeable gray spot. But notice those rough marks that were left on the surface by the scraper. When printed, those marks could hold ink and appear as dirty smudges on the proof. The scraping marks have to be smoothed out with a burnisher. The burnisher is made of a highly polished material such as agate or steel. It has to be harder than the copper. With lots of pressure, the burnisher smooths out tiny irregularities in the copper surface. So now you've seen the entire process that I used to make the plate for Labyrinth Valley. We've looked at some influences on the preliminary design and I've shown you how the image was created on the plate. But the plate is not an end in itself. It is merely a tool, a matrix that gets us to the final step that is the process of printing. It's time to pull a proof from the plate. I've set the old Buren aside for a while. Part 3 will show how Labyrinth Valley was printed.